Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. back to the fourth trimester podcast. I'm Sarah Trott and I'm joined today with special guest Brianna Battles and today's episode is all about exercise during pregnancy and just after pregnancy in the postpartum period. Before we dive in, I wanted to thank our Patreon sponsors and encourage anyone who's interested in sponsoring the show to go to our uh, Patreon page and there's a link to that on our website which is fourth trimester podcast.com. And that is also where you can sign up for our newsletter should you be interested in hearing more from us. So please do sign up. So Brianna is a strength and conditioning coach, and she has a practice out of Thousand Oaks. She's been doing it for quite a while. She specializes in women's health and fitness, and in particular, pre and postnatal athleticism. And she's also the very busy mommy of a three-year-old boy. Um, So There's a lot of experience um, that she has, and she brings to the table with these conversations. Uh, And I should also say, in addition to having her master's degree in coaching and athletic administration and her bachelor's in kinesiology, and if you'd like to hear more about her background and her practice and everything she does, her website is everyday-battles.com, and it's very easy to Google and find her as well, because her last name is Battles. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So welcome, Brianna. Thank you so much for being on our program today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got into doing what you're doing today. Well, it uh, it definitely, I feel, is a calling for me. I wasn't always working with primarily women or um, I haven't always owned my own business, but I've always been in the fitness world in some capacity, like at least for the like the last eight years or so. Um, but what I guess encouraged me and I when I felt called to start my own business was after the birth of my son, um, about three, almost three and a half years ago, um, because I had a really rough um, delivery and a really hard recovery. Fourth trimester was pretty hard for me. Um, and I realized that there's not a lot of information out there for women, at least in America on how to heal and how to exercise and move postpartum. We're just kind of told you're cleared and, you know, you can go back and resume activity, but that's just not good enough information. So, um, it was through my own like self advocacy and research that I, I realized that I had a pretty severe a uh, case of diastasis recti, which I know we'll touch on a bit later. And just through a lot of trials and tribulations, I ended up getting connected to the right people in order to help heal that dysfunction. And I realized that if um, I felt this lost and confused and overwhelmed with the information that exists on the internet, uh, social media, um, doctors all saying different things, um, you know, a lot of women were confused and moms matter, their health matters, their, you know, physical, mental, emotional, all of that is so connected. And um, it really has never felt like there's a lot of people advocating for this particular population. Um, It seems like moms get forgotten about a lot. So um, I just felt really called to to take what I could, like my background in education and, you know, exercise science and in coaching and start my own business where I could work with women through these chapters and help them recover uh, postpartum to make a 
uh, return to the fitness that they enjoy and like with my high level athletes, like get them back to competition. Um, and then for my like lifestyle fitness moms, just get them moving and functioning as a form of self care. So it's been, I have a pretty wide scope with the women that I work with, but it keeps me on my toes and I really love it because uh, postpartum doesn't discriminate. <laughs> Pregnancy is temporary and postpartum is forever. And so the more information we can have about our bodies and health during these chapters, the better. I absolutely agree. Um, I find it fascinating that you yourself felt confused about right. the right way to care for yourself, given this is your area of expertise. Right. So the funny thing is, um, like, women's health is not taught in uh, undergraduate in undergraduate school for me anyway, and in kinesiology, extra science, there's no emphasis in women's health. Um, and nor is there like any program. So even physical therapists have to get trained, um, have to have a specialty in this to know. So there, there's just really not a whole lot of information out there. And, um, it did take a lot of my own like forced continuing education to get better answers because I just assumed I was healthy, I was fit, I was in shape, I felt really confident in my movement patterns and knowledge surrounding my body, but pregnancy poses different demands and uh, postpartum poses even greater demands. So we cannot just, quote, like, trust our bodies. That's just not good enough information. That is a very small piece of what it means to um, take care of our body and recover and and actually be fit, not just during pregnancy, but, um, you know, for the remainder of our life, that's a priority. And what was your pregnancy and postpartum experience like, like in general, mm -hmm. but also in relation to exercise and how you stayed fit and stayed healthy? Right. Well, during my pregnancy, I felt like really confident and really fit. I was set on having a natural childbirth and I felt just like really strongly about that. I I don't want to say that I thought my body was invincible, but I just felt a lot of confidence in like I was made to do this, you know, and I can keep doing what I've always done because I've been doing this for, you know, years. And so it was now I can look back and say that I was confident to a fault um, because you cannot like pregnancy just it requires different demands and our fitness during that chapter requires us to adapt a little bit, adapt our training a little bit more. And it goes so far beyond just, you know, basic exercise modifications. It's, it's everything because our, our physical structure changes so much. Um, and nobody talked to me about diastasis recti or pelvic floor dis or, you know, pelvic floor dysfunction as being, uh, potential implications of how we train during pregnancy, how we train in our early postpartum chapter. Um, all I had really seen was like the benefits of exercise during pregnancy and listen to your body and, you know, just, just keep moving. But there was no strategy to training. It was just really generic messaging. So it was kind of, you know, left to my own devices, which again, with, even with all the education in the world, it just didn't matter because it, it wasn't good enough for treating the big picture. Mm -hmm. So um, my early postpartum chapter was really difficult. I ended up with an emergency C-section and it was really traumatizing. Again, I really was set on having a natural childbirth. So I had these high expectations and of myself, of my body, of how things would be. And, um, you know, that. It didn't happen, and that was really hard for me to recover from in a lot of ways. And um, I feel like that was sort of what started this snowball effect of just feeling like I was drowning for a long time. Like I was really low, um, really anxious, really like I just wanted to feel normal again. Um, I wanted to feel normal in my body. I wanted to feel like like I didn't lose my whole life and my identity and acclimating to having a baby and a baby that cried all the time was like, it was so like really hard on me. And I just, I feel like I just had a really rough time coming into motherhood for a variety of reasons. Like 
you know, problems breastfeeding, but I was really hell bent on pursuing that because I felt like that was the only thing in my control still was trying to breastfeed. So, um, that fourth trimester was brutal. And then the pressure to work in the fitness industry and, um, you know, quote, should get my body back. And, uh, like that messaging is so destructive for women. Um, and so I steer clear of talking about that with any of my clients. It's not about getting your body back. It's about, um, getting your function back and healing well and, um, letting, like learning to be a mom first because the gym and fitness will always be there and we can do a lot more damage in that desperation to lose weight um, and, you know, force our body to change faster than we do if we just have a slower and more peaceful approach to it. So what was your workout regimen like before you were pregnant? I mean, I understand this is your career, so it's probably not... (laughs) Like it might not be the example that everyone should hold themselves to or feel bad right. for not doing that. But like what what was your like typical regiment like before you were pregnant? And then what was it like during your pregnancy? Well, it's pretty much been the same um, or was the okay. same. So I was training like maybe five to six days a week or so. Like I lifting weights, kind of CrossFit sort of um, vibe, I suppose. Uh, mixed with powerlifting. And then during pregnancy, I, I kept pretty much training the same way with some basic modifications, but I was still, you know, lifting heavy. I w- ran until I was like seven months pregnant. I just like very general strength and conditioning. Um, and then I was cleared at eight weeks postpartum and I wasn't really able to do anything during that time. Um, Right. Like the first eight weeks were just, again, really, really hard. Um, and, you know, my doctor was like, well, everything looks good. You know, your scars healing well and whatever. And I was just sort of left to kind of troubleshoot what my fitness routine would be like. And I started slow. But again, there was no strategy in place as far as my alignment, my breathing, how to progress, um, you know, how to progress my programming. And so I just sort of, I did try to start slow and then I just did what I thought I should be able to do. Um, but I didn't do it in a way that was helping a diastasis heal. And, um, I did not have pelvic floor dysfunction, but I feel like I easily could have. And so many women that are super fit and strong and whether they have great deliveries or not, like, and nobody can escape like I don't know like just pregnancy and postpartum and our deliveries just they don't discriminate like anybody you know can can be as impacted by birth so there's just no getting around that and how we train can either help with healing or preventing or it can hinder that mm-hmm. and contribute yeah, and contribute is what I'm hearing loud and clear. Looking back, would you have worked out as intensely as you did during your pregnancy? Had you known what you know now? It wasn't so much about the intensity. It was how I was doing it. So what I like to say is it's not so much what you're doing, it's how you're doing it. So, um, and that has a lot to do with, you know, how are you moving? Are you holding your breath? How are you like standing? How are you um like, what is your rib cage doing? What kind of pressure is that putting on your abdomen or your pelvic floor? Like, it all has to do with strategy, not so much about set rules with, well, don't do this and don't do that. Now, I don't have my clients run um, pretty much once their belly starts to, like, really show. Because to me, there's we have to learn to measure risk versus reward. And not all coaches are going to know how to do that. And not all practitioners, very few actually, will know how to have that conversation. So women need to be informed um, enough about their body to say, well, can I do this activity or should I do it? Um, And, you know, yeah, maybe you can run at nine months pregnant, but I don't think that um, the risk is worth it. And I can tell you that women who have prolapse and ran through their pregnancy and are now like, why did nobody tell me that, you know, running can create a lot of extra pressure on my pelvic floor and contribute to prolapse. 
Like, well, like, yeah, maybe for one woman it doesn't happen, but it does increase chances. And so that's where we have to be really aware about um, our exercise choices, both during pregnancy and in the immediate postpartum chapter. Mm -hmm. Our exercise choices that we do after even that can create dysfunction that pregnancy did not create. It's just that we haven't healed yet. I mean, it sounds like with your C-section, like the Mm -hmm. doctors had a specific amount of time that you had to wait. C-section or not, what are some general guidelines around the amount of time you think is is worth considering? Right. So I guess that's a, it depends sort of question. Um, Mm -hmm. Because every woman's going to be different and like, there's no rush to start exercising. And I see, I see like such a huge spectrum. There's women that are like, three days postpartum, like, I want to start doing something. And I'm like, girl, like, slow down and sleep and, like, acclimate to this new chapter. But then there's people that are just, they are so tired, they are, you know, in a hard transition, and like, training just isn't their top priority. And that's okay, too. So I say, if you feel good, and you want to move that, like, walking and getting in touch, like doing your breathing, and, um, you know, just really paying attention to your alignment because in those first few months postpartum, all you're doing is sitting and holding a baby. And then some women go back to work and more than likely they're going to be sitting even more on their pelvic floor. Um, Excuse me. So um, like we just have to pay attention to the little things early on postpartum and then introduce exercise as we feel ready um, emotionally and for the right reasons, <laughs> mm-hmm. I guess. So uh, yeah, that guideline is so different. I, for surgery, they said eight weeks, but um, I have my C-section moms like start their breathing and um, just trying to connect their core and pelvic floor early on. And and same with like a, a vaginal delivery, like there's things we can do prior to being quote cleared. Um, but is that intense exercise? No. And would I ever recommend intense exercise right after being cleared? No. A lot of the conversations we have on this podcast are focused around care during the postpartum period. So the specific handful of months right after birth. And it's about allowing the person who's just given birth, (laughs) allowing her to relax and recover. And that could mean you know, having other people help with taking care of their house and their other children and their other responsibilities and really focusing on that, that healing aspect. And so often like the topic of exercise doesn't really enter into the picture a whole lot, but there, other than like the intense pressure, I think that women feel, which you've touched on, like, let's talk about, let's talk more about that. Like, where does this pressure come from? Like, why do women feel this intense pressure to just exercise and bounce back? Right. Well, because that's what we're told. And that's what we see is like so and so three months after having a baby. It's unfortunately just our culture and these expectations that we're told like, oh, you'll about you were so fit, you'll bounce right back or you're so whatever, you'll bounce right back. And so we have this preconceived notion that, you know, we're we grow a baby and that we should just kind of disappear. And, you know, it typically doesn't even for the most fit person. It just takes it's a process. And in regard to that, slow is fast postpartum. So yeah, slow is fast when it comes to postpartum fitness. Like slower you take it, the like faster you'll recover because there won't be that desperation factor. And we're giving our body adequate time to heal just like naturally first hormonally kind of get reset, adjust to breastfeeding if that's what, you know, the mother is choosing to do or is able to do. Um, and then oh my gosh, like sleeping, like it has such a huge impact on our body and our healing and our mental health. So um, those have to be the priority as obviously you talk about in fourth trimester, but um, a lot of women I work with just, they will take the fourth trimester and also try to like, you know, exercise their belly off, you know, and, um, And they'll try to just get out on a run or start doing sit-ups. And those are two things that are really, you know, pretty detrimental to our body during that chapter. Mm, I just want to repeat something you said, because it sounds like if women, if we're able to, to, to give ourselves permission to rest and recover and take it slowly and enjoy that early, early period of recovery, 
um, in terms of sleeping and, and taking care of our bodies, then we, then recovery actually is faster in right. the long run. Right. Wow. Cause a lot of women get injured like early on or create dysfunction early on because they haven't healed and because they're trying to just resume life as normal. And like life isn't normal after you just have a baby, like, like, hello, I don't care if it's your first baby or your sixth baby, like transition is transition. And it takes a toll on our physical body and our mind. And, you know, we kind of just have to honor that. And if you feel inclined to move and like, for me, movement is my self care, it's my, it is good for my mental health. So, you know, if it, my time comes again to go through the fourth trimester, um, you know, getting out and doing gentle movement initially, just some walking and not feel like, oh my gosh, I have to get back to the gym. Um, you know, that allows our body to heal. And the more we're able to just give ourselves that grace, um, you know, the faster we will recover. That whole first year, it's it's so much, it's so far beyond the fourth trimester. It's really like that first year postpartum that just it changes our world and we have to like really prioritize what matters. So much of what you're saying sounds relevant for both our physical selves and our emotional selves and our emotional well-being. Uh, so for example, on our last episode, I was speaking with Marissa Belger who wrote the first 40 days and she was talking a lot about relationships and she made the point that there's no going back there's only through and it's a new, it's a new thing. There's no, after you have the baby, you just go back to something else. Like that just doesn't exist. And it sounds right. like the same pitfalls in terms of thinking that can happen with thinking about, um, the body. Right. Right. We just kind of have to like own where we are at and know that it's kind of a temporary phase and get the support that we need and give ourselves that grace to just heal and get connected and advocate for ourselves. Like if you need something doesn't feel right. Like I have so many clients that are like, well, I know I didn't feel totally normal down there at my six week appointment, but my doctor just told me um, that it's normal and that I'm cleared anyway. And that woman ended up having like a pretty severe prolapse. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, if something does not feel right in your vagina, you need to advocate for yourself because that is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And we just have this is women's health is just totally like, you know, really just kind of ignored. Like it's get the baby. It's, you know, support the woman through the pregnancy, get the baby out. And after that, you're kind of left to your own uh, devices to figure out how to be a mom and figure out what's normal for your body and what's not. And most of the time women have no clue what's normal for their body and what's not. Can we talk about some of the terms in a little more depth? Diastasis recti, prolapse, pelvic issues, pelvic floor issues. Can we just kind of talk about what each one of those are right. and maybe any input you have around how to how to prepare and strengthen your body so that there's a lower chance of these things developing? Right. So um, diastasis recti is when the left and the right sides of the abdomen separate to make room for the baby during pregnancy. So that's like the line of a six pack. Um, that fascia line called the linea alba needs to spread to make room for the growing baby. Um, now after pregnancy, a diastasis is normal, but if it does not heal, that's when it becomes a dysfunction. Okay. Cause it's that fascia that is just so stretched out. Um, and then with it not being able to even kind of approximate again, it can create back pain, hip pain. People say like, oh my gosh, I feel like my core is just so weak or I'm not, I don't, I'm not connected there. And that's like what I had. Um, uh, pelvic floor dysfunction is uh, incontinence and that's leaking when you sneeze or run or, you know, jump and, you know, moms always laugh and they say, oh my gosh, I just peed a little. And they think it's, you know, pretty normal and, you know, it's common but it is not normal. And that is a sign of pelvic floor dysfunction. And then prolapse is when um, it, like the, your vaginal walls collapse and it can feel like you know, sex can be painful. Um, it can feel like a tampon is, is hanging out a little bit. 
Um, it can be hard to walk. So these are things that women feel, they experience, and oftentimes they don't realize is an issue um, because nobody really talks about it. Hey, fellow parents, can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family, and your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memories secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the family album map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. So um, and pelvic floor physical therapy in the United States just isn't um, super common. Like, I mean, it exists definitely, but a lot of people do not know that it exists. So, you know, I try to, you know, make sure that people know that that is a service that's available. And then there are people like me who try to bridge the gap between physical therapy and fitness and, you know, supporting women so that they do know, um, kind of what's up with their body and how, what to do about it. So, um, yeah. So what do you do about it? (laughs) Is that kind of like the next question? Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, there are probably a lot of listeners who are thinking about becoming pregnant for the first time or who are pregnant or who just had a baby. Um, what, what can we share with them to help like either prevent the chances of these things from happening or, um, or just address like how to, how to gently address each one. From a physical and exercise standpoint. Right. Well, a lot of it, again, it's not so much about um, what you do as it is how you're doing it, but our alignment really matters. And that's, you know, obviously we can't, you guys can't see me right now, but, um, you know, how we're standing during the day, a lot of moms, even before pregnancy, but pregnancy really brings this out and postpartum, it definitely does, um, stand with like their butt totally tucked under their body, which brings the trajectory of their stomach up. And so that makes it really hard for the diaphragm to work with the pelvic floor. That also puts a lot of, a lot more pressure on the linea alba. That's that line of the six pack. And so how we hold our body, how our pressure is distributed in our core and in our pelvic floor through our lifestyle habits really matters. And now we add exercise on top of that. So, um, with an already kind of strained pressure system due to pregnancy, due to how we're most likely standing, um, you know, that if we're then holding our breath for everything, like, and not realizing it, like I have so many moms, I'm like, show me, show me how you squat and they'll do a squat and uh, they'll be holding their breath the whole time. And so, you know, that's something to, to keep in mind too, is why are we holding our breath? And it's probably because they don't feel very stable. Um, but there's a way of, of training that. So, and that's sinking our, our uh, breathing to our pelvic floor and that's adjusting how we stand. So the, you know, diastasis, pelvic floor dysfunction, they, they are pretty much, they're the same thing. Like they are sisters, they work together. So what can help prevent a diastasis or heal a diastasis can also help prevent and heal pelvic floor dysfunction and it has everything to do with how we stand how we move and how we breathe. Unfortunately, in the fitness communities, we've been cued to like tuck your, you know, tuck your tailbone or bring your belly button to your spine and all of that. I mean, we need our glutes to be involved in everything that we do, not just like tucked and squeezed all the time. That's not how any other muscle works. That's not how our pelvic floor works either. And so, you know, the glutes and the pelvic floor are like BFFs. So we have to have strong glutes during pregnancy strong glutes, postpartum, um, and be aware of how we're breathing and how we're standing when we're not at the gym, when we're not trying to start exercising. It's how you're holding your baby at two o'clock in the morning, because it's it's not just two o'clock in the morning. It's 
all day, every day, if you're baby wearing, if you're holding that baby, you know, you have that baby on your shoulder, your butt is tucked under and you're just like your rib cage is really thrusted up. Like just think of like the mom stance, right? Like, or if you look at a pregnant woman and she's waddling, like what does the front of her look like? Her belly is really rung up. Her butt is pretty flat looking and uh, it just creates more pressure on her linea alba and then on her pelvic floor. And then you add a delivery to that again, regardless of how that baby comes out um, it's still trauma whether it's, you know, through a C-section or a vaginal delivery, it still takes a toll on a woman's body. Um, and we learn to compensate really, really well, because that's what we're great at as human beings. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the perfect stance? Like, I mean, it sounds like what, even if women aren't necessarily going out and exercising, right. just some small tweaks around breathing and posture could make a big difference. So what's the perfect way to difference. be like standing and breathing? Right. And, you know, like nothing's ever going to be perfect, right? Because we're moms and there's a thousand demands and we can't always be really aware of, like, we can't always just be standing perfectly. Like that's not practical, but the more aware we are of like, oh my gosh, I've totally been standing with my butt tucked under for like ever now. Um, and we can make that adjustment the better. So I do want to just say like, we can't put extra pressure on to like be, you know, perfectly aligned all the time. Cause that's just, it's so impractical, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to stand with, your weight over the mid part of your foot versus standing with it in the heel. So ideally you want your weight really distributed well across the middle part of your foot. Mm -hmm. And then you want to have your ribs over your hips. So a lot of times our ribs are really thrusted up and this will still allow you to stand up straight. A lot of times people like will hunch their shoulders to accomplish this, but we need to learn how to separate our shoulders from our rib cage. So um, standing with your ribs over your hips and just kind of like leaning forward slightly to untuck your butt, like literally an inch or so. And sometimes women will feel like, oh, my gosh, I'm like leaning so far forward or I feel like I'm going to fall forward. But really, like they're standing up straight now. They were just leaning back a ton before. So our body kind of has to adapt like a new homeostasis. Mm hmm. Yeah. And the temptation to lean back is what? Because we're trying to balance this heavy Mm -hmm. belly. Right. The heavy belly and then holding a baby, breastfeeding, bottle feeding, like everything in our life is forward and we need to be strong posterior. Mm -hmm. Get our glutes involved when we're when they're totally tucked under. They're not involved when you're able to, like, distribute your weight, change the trajectory of your belly, whether you're pregnant or not. um, This is like a universal, like, conversation, truly. um, You know, that really impacts how efficient we are. And how much, like, how we're using our body to, like, preserve our health, strength, and function. Mm-hmm. What, um, yeah, I'm sitting up so much taller now. <laughs> <laughs> so this conversation. Um, so what do you, what would you say for, like, the new mom who's just had, you know, she's just had her new baby. Like, how could, like, we talked a little bit about the win and timings, but, like, how could how could they start to sort of safely, slowly begin to do exercise again while respecting the needs of the pelvic floor and the entire abdomen? Right. Um, in a very perfect world, I'd say if they're feeling like they're starting to get a little bit more sleep or they do feel like, okay, moving is going to make me feel better. You know, if moving is going to make them feel worse, then it's just not worth it yet. So it's really like listening to that side of your body where you can figure out like when exercise is appropriate based on how you are feeling (laughs) with sleep and adjusting and whatever. Um, And then from there, I'd say if you can go to a pelvic floor physical therapist in your area and it just it never hurts to have them check you out like it just. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that you have to keep going to therapy with them, but to have a consult and see you know, if they can do an internal exam or somebody who specializes in pelvic health. And that's, you know, it, it can be hard, hard to find, but there are resources. And um, that way they can just kind of give you more information than what your OB is about your body. They can, And, you know, if you're near um, a program that has or if you are near like a pre and postnatal trainer for somebody like me who specializes in this stuff, like we can also be good points of contact prior to beginning a exercise routine just so that, okay, are you checked for diastasis? How's your pelvic floor functioning? How's your breathing? How's your alignment? Because all of that matters before you uh, really start 
trying to get back into a fitness routine. But in general, I have, you know, a lot of my clients, I have them just start walking. Walking hills is awesome for, you know, healing that core and pelvic floor. Why? Because it forces you to use your glutes and puts you in a position walking uphill that, uh, you know, keeps that core and pelvic floor in a good, like just in a nice position to, uh, to kind of practice the breathing and getting the glutes involved. Um, I also have them just, but it totally depends on the, like the client. I wish there was like a set of rules for um, saying like, this is the order of operations, but there's just not like, it's so dependent. Um, There just isn't, is there? Would you say, would you say um, that it's a good idea to wait until one has stopped bleeding before doing a lot of heavy walking? Yeah. And then I think even that depends, like, how are they feeling? Are they feeling like they could go on like a little half mile walk, like up a few houses or something? Then great. If they really feel like they can do that. But I don't think anything is really like, there's no need to like push anything really. You know, so if we have to also know the mindset of the woman, like if she, I call them my athlete brains and I'm also one of them, like where like, oh, I can go walk a little bit further or no, I feel good enough. And like, do you, or is that just your brain trying to like kind of push it beyond what is actually going to be beneficial for you? So it's really taking a hard look at yourself, your habits, your mindset, and uh, being able to make really quality decisions for your long-term fitness during this kind of vulnerable chapter of your, of your life. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, personally, I had to be told not to do a lot of um, exercise or walking around or like, I guess I got it. I think I benefited from having a lot of information up front where I where I was being advised to prepare Mm -hmm. not to be very active um, for the first couple of months. And I am so, so thankful that I heard that loud and clear and was able to to recover. Um, because I, it just, I can't imagine on top of everything my body was going through with recovering from delivering a baby to then have some kind of complication thrown on top that I'd caused myself. <laughs> right. Right. And it's a hard, you know, a lot of women live with some serious guilt and it does contribute to postpartum depression when you have a dysfunction. when you start beating yourself up going, why did that happen? Or what did I do during pregnancy? And sometimes, sometimes we do cause it, but sometimes like, it's just, unfortunately it comes with the territory and you know that's not that's not to be disempowering but it's again to be able to like make informed choices around what we do and what we don't do and being able to measure risk versus reward you know because for me I I know that movement was really important to me and it was a huge part of my self-care and my mental health but could I be smarter about it yeah And I think there's a lot of women that like, that's the conversation we need to have is if you're really desiring to exercise and move, great. How can we meet you where you are? And if you're somebody who's like, I just need to chill and adjust to this whirlwind of whatever, then great. Like do that. And here's some things you can do that will help you connect with your core and pelvic floor so that it assists in your healing. Mm -hmm. So like, it's really, it's so individual and there are no rules. There's just strategies to helping women understand this chapter. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about mommy baby boot camps? Um, There's not a lot of quality control there. I think in theory it's great because it's a good sense. It's a good uh, community for moms to meet other moms, to be able to bring their, their kids with them or their baby Um, but I am yet to find a good organization pretty much anywhere, um, that is run by somebody who's truly qualified to work with that population, which seems very contra, um, contradictory, but because you would think somebody who's running a mommy baby boot camp sort of park workout program would have an idea about working with that population. And this is, the subject has gotten me so much heat, but Um, there is no quality control. I can watch my own like local community who, you know, I'll drive by and I just see moms with newborns that are jogging and doing so many like sit-ups and crunches and their form is awful. And 
I'm just like, of all chapters in your athletic life, this is when we have to be paying the most attention to volume, intensity, form, um, all of that. And the, so, yeah, there's just not a whole lot of quality control. And I've tried reaching out to a few organizations to say, like, hey, would you like me to do a continuing education chapter for your coaches? And they're not a fan of that. So, <laughs> But it's a problem because this is what women have in their communities. It's what they think to go to and do. Um, and, you know, their coaches will, you know, pose as being like qualified, I suppose, or, or like aware of these things. But more often than not, they're not asking women if they're peeing their pants when they're running or jumping and they're not asked, they're not checking them for diastasis and they're not giving them any strategies on how to heal that or modifications for when they do have that kind of injury. So then women are like, oh, my gosh, my left hip has been hurting forever now. And I've been doing stroller blah, blah, blah program for a year. And, yeah, what's up with this? And they go and they I have them go to a pelvic floor physical therapist, the left side of their pelvic floors and spasm. And they have uh, diastasis and they've been peeing for a year when they run. And they just nobody knew that. And they just thought that was normal. Mm. So that is like chronic like chronic case I hear that almost every day that's so sad because also like I I imagine there's like a portion of the population of moms in these groups that maybe didn't really have a regular exercise regimen before and this exercise thing is just all about the the ideas that they might have about like oh I need to bounce back I need to exercise so now's the time to do it right and and it's the most tender vulnerable time for the body it's like exactly and these programs (laughs) It is. And these programs capitalize on that exact desperation. We have 21 day fixes. We have body back programs. We have, you know, the rap companies that like all of these predatory marketing that go after new moms that want to get their body back. And they, they prey on that vulnerability Mm -hmm. with non evidence based, um, harmful practices. And it's, it, it, nothing pisses me off more to be completely honest than seeing that kind of spam and how many women fall for the quick fixes and for coaches and trainers and exercise programs that just are not helping them. If anything, they're kind of hurting them. And even if it's not immediate, like it, what's going to be sustainable? Like that's the conversation we need to have about postpartum fitness is what is truly sustainable in a way that you can keep showing up for something you enjoy and something that's going to keep you injury free and healthy. But people don't care about that until they have to care about that. They care about fitting into their genes again. Uh, And so that's the mindset shift that I'm really trying to, you know, advocate, but it's hard when you can't like, we're just surrounded by a fitness and, you know, honestly, like the female culture of wanting to look good and, and have that perception that like our life is put together and perfect. And it's just, it's not like for anybody. Oh my gosh, everybody's a hot mess. Like, hello. (laughs) So yeah, it's just, it's really, it's hard, but, um, you know, slowly I do see like the message catching on and, you know, in my community, I do try to really be a voice of reason. And there, there are other coaches and women doing what I do um, across the world. And I, and I know them, like I am connected with them. So um, I can refer to the good ones for sure. But uh, unfortunately, you know, we're still pretty inundated with people that are either 30 years behind in research or don't have any business coaching, um, you know, pregnant and postpartum women. Mm. I just wish we could go and replace all of that messaging with with a completely different script that our bodies performed miracles, that they need to be loved and adored and honored and change is okay and change is expected. And um, it's an honor that change is healthy and that's okay. Right. Change is good. And like, you know what, like when people talk about getting their body back, like our bodies are supposed to change and there is no avoiding that we are we're getting we get older every single day and isn't that a blessing you know like we are supposed to go through like a metamorphosis that's just how we're designed and like pregnancy is just one of those examples and recovering is just another example and like falling into a new 
body and lifestyle and habits, like all of that, it's just this continual process because what life is like as a 30 year old is probably not what life is going to be like as a 40 year old. And we have this opportunity to uh, keep changing, you know, and it doesn't have to be bad. Like transitions are like transitions are good. Mm -hmm. They can be good. It's just how we approach that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, What final thoughts do you have for our listeners today? (laughs) Just be your own advocate. Like, so much of what I had to go through was because I never stopped trying to, to heal, like to truly like take care of myself and get answers. Um, even in the face of being told a thousand different things, um, there's, there's always hope. And there are people out there that want to help you that have the right tools to help you. Um, but it's being aware, it's being your own advocate during pregnancy And especially after, because both chapters are really vulnerable and, um, you know, give yourself that grace to um, feel confident in your body and what it can do. But that can sometimes take time and that's okay. That fitness, like the gym, it will always be there. The gym is not going anywhere, but the chapter of life that you're in um, with pregnancy and that early postpartum is just, it's so fragile and short, even though it can feel like forever. I totally get that. Um, it's just the gym will always be there and that can, it can wait. And we, there are smart ways to go about it that will keep you, that will allow you to have self care and allow you to have strength and strength and function and health that you want. Thank you so much, Brianna. We've learned so much from you today. Oh, thanks for having me. (laughs) Absolutely. And thank you to our patrons who are sponsoring our program. Uh, If you'd like to sponsor the Fourth Trimester Podcast, you can go to patreon.com and you can sign up for our newsletter at Fourth Trimester Podcast. Please do remember to share this podcast with any new or expecting parents in your life. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone, and I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband Ben, daughter Penelope, and baby girl Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Hello again. Bicycle man, I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you. You got your wheels, you got your gears. You ride around town without any fear You got your pedals, you got your brakes You always wear your helmet for safety's sake